question divisibility and parity. Harold, please. Very good. So this is joint work with Max Rajiville at uh, Caltech. And so, um, but, all right. So what is the motivation for all of this work? Because it's going to get a bit abstract very quickly to the extent that graph theory can be called abstract. But so there is a central problem in analytic number theory. You have a correlation like this, and you want to estimate it. And that's usually hard. It's usually, well, it's often both interesting and hard. Um, some people care about some of these forms for modular forms, but if we care about the integers themselves and we care about the hard part of the multiplicative structure of Z, the fine multiplicative structure if you want, then one thing we can study is the Liouville function. So uh, the Liouville function is a function that is one if n has an even number of prime factors and minus one if it has an odd number of prime factors, where the prime factors are counted with multiplicity. If you don't want to count with them with, with them with multiplicity, that's okay. That's basically Möbius. That's fine, and it doesn't make much of a difference. But let's work this way. This is a completely multiplicative function. So how hard is the is this sort of question about correlations for the Liouville function? So actually, much of what I will be saying is much more general than that, but the Liouville function is simple and really hard. It's one of the ones for which this problem is at its hardest. So just getting that the average of lambda of n times lambda of n plus one tends to zero is open and very hard. That's what's called Charles conjecture in degree two. Charles conjecture in degree one would be just that the average of lambda is uh, zero as x goes to infinity. And that's non-trivial, that's equivalent to the prime number theorem. All right, so for a long time, there was little or no progress. And then there were some remarkable developments a few years ago. So in 2015, Matamak and Rajiville proved that, that uh, lambda averages to zero, not just from one up to x, when x goes to infinity, but over short intervals, or at least over most short intervals. So this sort of thing was known for short, when short means no shorter than n to the one six. So you take the average of the interval started starting at x of size roughly n, and this interval sort of of size h greater than n to the one six. That was known, but they managed to show that the average is zero on average, even for h going to to infinity extremely slowly. Say h could be log 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 n. This would still be true, and that was really remarkable. And then Tao using the result. Soon thereafter, showed um, a weak or logarithmic version of uh, Charles' conjecture in degree two. He showed that if you weigh um, lambda of n times lambda of n plus one by the weight one over n, then the average is, uh, yeah, the average does tend to zero. So this is n up to x. All right. And he doesn't give a bound, but his method can be made to give a bound. And it's of the quality of one over log, 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 log x to some alpha. It's no worse than one fifth, say one fifth. It probably can be made a bit better. Um, okay, that's a lot of logs, but still, it's a finite number of logs. Um, so what is the first step of Tao's proof? What does it have to do with what Matamaki and Rajibiel did? Well, the first step, which isn't hard, is to show that this reduces, this logarithmic Chawla statement reduces to showing that as you average uh, over lambda of n, uh, as you average over n, as an, and as you average over a set of primes p, and I really mean average. Here, curly L is the sum of one over p, so it's the right thing to divide when you take the average. And if you restrict to the primes dividing n, and that's important, then this double average is going to zero. So if you manage to prove that, you've proved our statement. And the connection between that and Matamaki Rajivil should be clear. I mean, actually, in the number theory to reduce a very difficult problem with one sum to a problem with a double sum, and then you hope that it will be easier. If we did not have that condition, all right. So I said it should be clear, but in fact, that can be a bit deceptive. I've highlighted this condition p divides n because if it weren't there, and if instead you had a, a weight of one over p, 
So if P were out of range 3D, but with weight one over P, then that this statement that this average is little of one would be roughly equivalent to what Matamaki Rajivil did. It's a slightly different kind of hard, uh, average, but you can basically reduce one to the other. Now, the sticking point, of course, that there is this condition. So how did Tau manage to remove it? So how to replace that condition by the weight one over P? Well, he didn't manage to remove it always, but he shows that there exists a set of primes, not too small, but the primes themselves have to be small, quite small, for which um, removing that condition and replacing it by the weight one over P does not make much difference. And what's the strategy? It's, well, the idea is that entropy is additive. It's a coarse measure of correlation, but it's, well, let's think of this in statistical terms. No, P over N should have, on average, not that much to do with the value of lambda of N. It could because the world is evil, but it cannot do that for every set of primes P because you run out of entropy, you run out of mutual information if you take many distributed sets P. And for each of them, you get unlucky. At the end, you will run out of unluck. Okay, so that works. Believe it or not, the somewhat if the argument they have just given can be made rigorous, and that's what Tau did. Um, what's another way? So here's another strategy. I will consider a graph, which in fact, what well, is equivalent to one introduced in the joint paper by the Matamaki Rajivya Tau, where they show that the, this graph is basically locally connected uh, almost everywhere. And it's also considered by Tau in his paper where he shows with Chawla, he considers it and then he puts it aside because it's the he sees more or less what direction things are going and then he says this is basically too hard for now. So let me define the graph. So this is a graph whose vertices are integers between big N and big 2N and where you put an edge between N and N plus P for little p in your set of primes, big P, big bold P, if and only if P divides N. Then, you know, then, then and only then do you put an edge. And so Tao says that, you know, if you could prove that this is an expander graph of sorts, he has to say of sorts because, for example, this graph is not regular. Um, you should be able to prove this sort of, of and he says. Held. What do you mean by an expander graph? There's an issue with your sound. Do you want to try turning off your video to save bandwidth? Oh, there's an issue. With, there's an issue with your sound at times. Do you want to try turning off your video to see if that helps? Can you hear me? Uh, I will turn off. <clears throat> you should just continue, Harold. I mean, the sound is not always great, but it's still audible. Where are we? Some sort of expand property. Could you hear me? Yes. Should I proceed from here? Uh, okay. Property, I mean a property of spectrum of an operator um, F set um, of complex number. That's very general. Some morally to box. Sort of later can hope. Clear. 
everywhere which work, because short works will not be able to go that far, just in the Italian distance. We should aim for some sort of uh, local standard, almost everywhere, but we also want it to be. Um, so we will prove that the idea where a convention is functional, is functional, is actually in the steps, sometimes to the degree. The other well, so define what great. So, what I'm going to do is the following the agency operator of gamma. The adjacent of F we all to get rid of the value of each one exactly, but in order to get rid also of the effect of locality, we are going to define the same an adjacency operator, but not for gamma, rather for gamma prime, if you wish, the naive model of gamma. It's uh, a graph um, where you have the same vertices, but where you always put an edge between n and n plus p for p in both p, not only when p divides n, but you give to that edge the weight one over p. All right. So you, you already see where this, this gamma, graph, gamma prime is playing two roles. It's playing a role, the role of a naive model at the level of the graph, but also eventually it will mean that if we manage to solve a problem about the difference of these two operators, we will reduce the problem we had originally to a problem of Matamaki Rajivio types. So yeah, everything we're, we, we're not actually going to use Matamaki Rajivio in our main result, but it will be an expansion type result, which will allow us to reduce problems such as logarithmic Chawla, but more general, two problems of Matamaki Rajivial type that we know how to show, how to prove, how to solve. Thanks to Matamaki Rajivial. And down. And so we define A to be the difference between those two adjacency operators. We do have to exclude some edges. That's why I said almost everywhere before. For instance, we should, we have to remove the edge, the, um, the vertices of very high degree. They're, they are rare. Numbers don't usually have many, prom, many prom, more prime divisors than they should, but they do exist. So we get rid of those. Uh, and so we will, work, we will work with a restriction, A restricted to X. So X is a large of E, or I mean, really large. So the complement is small. Okay, so here's the main theorem. Take P, we will not show just that there exists a set of primes, but we take P to be any set of primes in an integral H0 comma H. H0 shouldn't be too small, um, but H can be actually quite large if we want. And that's also a, 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 an important difference with the work of Tao. He said, his primes cannot be larger than log N or so. We can make our, we can let our primes be lar as large as E to the square root of log N or so. Okay, so our operator A is ab as above, L is the average degree as usual. Then I claim, we claim, that there is, in fact, a large set X, at least the complement is small, such that every eigenvalue of A restricted to X is O of square root of the average degree. So how good is that? How strong is this result? Well, the trivial bound will be big O of L. Um, now, the result we were hoping for was little O of uh, L, that would already give us a result of tau type, but in fact, we can do better than that. We can do O of square root of L. You should think of L, of course, as going to infinity. How large? It depends on how large it takes the set P to be. So this is, in fact, so to speak, O of Ramanujan. I mean, a Ramanujan graph is an optimal expander. That's not entirely well defined here because the degree is not constant, but this is clearly, the, yeah, this is O of square root of L means O of the theoretical optimum. All right. So let me give you a page of corollaries, and then I will give you the briefest of sketches of the proof. So some corollaries. So first of all, so this is a, a graph theoretical result, really. Well, with numbers here in it, the integers, the vertices are integers. 
is defined by divisibility conditions. But lambda is not anywhere in that statement. But you can derive consequences about lambda or about other functions. I put lambda here in fact because lambda is hard. So first of all, you do get logarithmic chaula, and in fact the quality is now double log. So you get O of one over square root of log log. Whereas tau, as he said, had four logs, and then tau and Terabinen, uh, had three logs. That was a later work by them. Now Theo tau and Terabinen also proves something actually a bit stronger, and we we again managed to get something stronger than this, qualitatively similar but quantitatively stronger. Namely, um, that um, at almost all scales, uh, well, I will not make this entirely precise, but at almost all scales, Chaula, strong Chaula holds. And the, the bound, I'm not making it entirely precise in the sense that I'm not saying exactly what the bounds here will be, but let's say that the number of exceptions and the quality of the bound is better, is of quality double log. Now, the, uh, you can also derive other corollaries, for instance, you don't have to average this overall n. You could restrict to n or n plus one having your favorite number of prime divisors, as long as it's not a very rare number of prime divisors, and you would still get cancellation. And moreover, just uh, to be really concrete, so for any k, your favorite k, if you just restrict <coughs> to the integers n that have exactly k prime divisors, for instance, if you restrict to the integers n that have integer part of log log, x, log log x prime divisors on the nose, then you have that the average of lambda of n plus one is O of one over log log to the three fourths. Yeah. At almost all scales, again. Not, yeah. So for honesty's sake, I should say, well, what happens if k equals one? This would give you this classical open problem of average lambda, la, averaging lambda of p plus one. And we don't even know that there are infinitely many primes p for which lambda p of p plus one is one or minus one. Uh, yes, but the problem is that there, uh, if k is one, primes are so rare that this bound is not non-trivial. So because this is worse than one over log x. So we don't solve that problem, but we do solve the analogous problem for n equal to say exactly the integer part of log log x or exactly the integer part of log log x plus 2,721. All right, so let us go in the remaining seven minutes, or maybe eight, if I'm told that this interruption was the fault of the gods. Um, let me give you the main ideas. So uh, the first step, which for some people, see, people it shouldn't be unfamiliar. Um, the, uh, there are large multiplicity arguments are common in the literature. This is not quite a large multiplicity argument, but morally it's related, and the purpose is the same. So we start by showing that if there exists a large eigenvalue, then there are many large eigenvalues. Now, it's not necessarily that the eigenvalue has large multiplicity, but there are many large eigenvalues. And the reason is just what was our bane before, that the edges are short. That's, that's basically the reason. It's not a much more complicated argument than that. Uh, and hence, the trace so the, because there are many large eigenvalues, the trace of a to a 2k is large, even for moderate k. Okay, so our task now is to bound the trace of a to a 2k. It's really restricted to x, the 2k. Very good. And that's a sum over a closed path uh, of length 2k, a sum in witchcraft, not quite in gamma, in, so to speak, gamma minus gamma prime, in that we use the edge weights in gamma minus the edge weights in gamma prime. Now, because of that minus, there's going to be cancellation that we're going to be able to exploit. When are we going to get cancellation? When many primes appear exactly, when there are quite a few primes that appear exactly once each. The more primes there are, the more primes p there are, such that p appears only once in the walk, in the path, um, you are, uh, the more cancellation you're going to get. So we can ignore the path with too many repeated, uh, too many non-repeated primes. So our task is now to count paths. And by that, uh, by that I mean n, n1 is equal to n plus a sign, plus or minus one times p1. And then it's n2, which is n plus p1 minus p2, say, and so forth and so forth until you come back to the origin. That's a close path. And where almost every prime appears more than once. And the weight here given to this path will be the product of one over pi over all nasty, bad i's. Nasty, bad i's are the ones for which pi 
fails to divide an i. So whenever pi fails to divide an i, we pay a penalty. And that makes sense because those are the corresponding to the edges that exist in gamma prime, but not in gamma. So they have weight one over p. Okay, so step two, um, for the sake of our argument, we want to avoid, even though our primes will be recurring, so our primes will generally appear more than once, we want to avoid early recurrences. We want to avoid cases where there's a prime pi and then other things happen, at least a different one different prime pj comes up and then pi appears again as pi prime. It's the same very pink prime, I mean in magenta, maybe foxia. At any rate, with i prime minus i small. Um, and we want to avoid that. For I, for we want to, we don't want that to happen with i prime minus i small. So we avoid that by removing from x all n that cause such recurrences. And it's actually not hard at all to show that that's a small set. What is much harder to show is that that set is well distributed on arithmetic progressions. And we need that so that the previous step, of course I'm not giving the steps quite in order, so the previous steps, the previous step uh, is legit. So that you can get translation. So the way to get that it's well distributed, well, that's technically difficult. We ended up developing a generalization of Ronsif, but for conditions, not for conditions modulo prime, modulo primes as usual, but conditions with modulo composite numbers. And the problem there is that because of redundancy, because the condition modulo three and a condition modulo 15, no, or a condition modulo three and a condition modulo 10 can have the same conjunction, logically speaking, as a condition modulo six and a condition modulo five, the product is the same, that doesn't, really ha that doesn't happen for primes. Um, you could get some combinatorial explosion that doesn't happen in the usual theme, but we avoid that using Rota's cross, uh, crosscut theorem. I'm making a long story short. But that's, that's a sieve that should have other applications. So this, that's, that's my gut feeling. Um, the main part of the proof then is to bound the number of paths, closed paths with no early recurrences with few non-repeated primes and small weight if many i's are bad. So if many pi's are not divided by i. Now, if, PI, if i and i prime are good and pi equals pi prime, then clearly pi is going to divide the difference between the two ni's. So it's going to divide this linear combination of primes. So you have this entire system of divisibility relations. It's going to be a large system unless you have many bad i's. And if you have many bad i's, the weight of the path is small and so it doesn't matter. Okay, so you have this large system. Doesn't necessarily mean it's a good system, or, or rather, we want to show that there are a few solutions to this system, and that's that's not going to be so easy. So how would you show that this system of many divisibility relations usually has few solutions? This could be very, I mean, you know, the, the, you could cook up examples in which this system is basically has basically the same linear combination repeated over and over, and that wouldn't be good. So the idea is to color some primes blue and others red, and we're going to define these formal linear combinations consisting of just counting the red equivalence classes. By an equivalent, so I create these equivalence classes by defining i to be equivalent to i prime if pi equals to pi prime. All right, and then we estimate the rank of the i minus the i prime for i equivalent to i prime, that is the same prime in both instances, just like here, uh, with both things blue. And the idea is that if we prove that the uh, rank, that is, that is if the space spanned by these things, by these vectors, by these linear formal linear combinations is large, then by some very, very, very basic geometry of numbers, you can show that there are a few solutions to the system and we are very happy. So um, it's enough to show that most shapes of walks by a shape being given by an equivalent relation of the signs give large rank. And then if there's a minority of walks, and there has to be with small rank, for instance, walks that are trivial, walks that are one step forward, you know, like this. P1, P2, minus P2, minus P1, P3, minus P3. Those exist, but those shapes are going to be rare. Particularly the trivial box are not, not like this one, are not going to be so common, and so they give a small contribution. So the solution is uh, you define another graph whose vertices are equivalence classes, and you, where you put edge, an edge between i and i plus one, or an equivalence class of i and i plus one for every i. So whenever two equivalence classes have adjacent representatives. And then you're going to color blue some connected set of vertices with large boundaries. 
And those exist. You can pick blue, for instance, to be the internal nodes in the spanning tree, in a spanning tree of this graph. Uh, and there is a non-resulting graph theory due to a bunch of people in the 80s. I will give all of the names if this were a longer talk. Uh, so kudos to all of them. If there are, uh, so if you put all of those versions of the result together, you can show that if there are many vertices of degree three or greater in your graph, then there exists a spanning tree with many leaves. Um, and what you can then show is that few words, so few shapes, give rise to trees with few vertices of degree three or greater. Uh, a trivial shape, a trivial word, gives rise to a walk with vertices of degree two. And more general walks giving rise to trees with few vertices of degree three or greater are not much more complicated than that. And that forces them to be rare. So there's a little argument that feels yeah, that, uh, that does that job. So that's it. And I think um, I finished on time, sort of. Great. Thank you very much, Harold. Uh, we do have time maybe for a question. Uh, if someone wants to write something into the Q and A. If not, <clears throat> again, Harold, thank you very much. And our next talk will be in two minutes. <laughs>